This is the final week of our missions emphasis that we have been going through. I had the opportunity two weeks ago of sharing with you the vision of our, of our church as it relates to how we want to engage in the missions, not only world missions, but local missions. Our, our vision statement says, from, from locally to globally, pursuing every heart with the love of Jesus. Today, we're going to have an opportunity to hear from somebody that we support that represents the locally hand of that mission. For those of you that may have already joined us in the first service, you know what you are looking forward to. But William Payne and I met about seven years ago. I believe that he had just been appointed the new director, and uh, I have had an awful lot of time just to observe this man and his family. I highly love and respect him. Out of all of the missionaries that we support around the world, locally to globally, he may communicate with me more than anybody else as to what's happening on the Syracuse campus so that we can rejoice in the things that are taking place. William Payne is the Syracuse campus director. He is the chaplain of the football team. He is the chaplain of the basketball team. More importantly, he is husband to Melinda and father to four great kids. And I want you to know that he wouldn't be what he is today without a phenomenal wife. Melinda, would you just wave at us this morning? We're so (laughs) grateful to have you with us today. There is a lot of things that are happening when the whole world comes to a campus right next to us. And there are individuals and students that come that have phenomenal ability athletically but don't know who they can trust. And in the middle of that, William Payne becomes our hand extended to Syracuse. Would you give a warm grace, Assembly of God, welcome as we welcome William Payne to the pulpit this morning. Thank you, He's, uh, thank you, Pastor. It's always great to be here with you all. Pastor Doug and his wife, Cindy, seven years ago, uh, we met them, and they took us to the Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> and have you ever gone to dinner with someone, and they invite you, and you don't know what the spending limit is? So you kind of, you get in the menu, and you know, they come, and they say, you want appetizers, and you're not saying nothing because you want to see what they're going to do. Or then they say, what do you want to drink? And you're trying to see, make sure they don't say water, so you have to say water. So I'm sitting there just waiting. And he gave the word. He said, you guys can get what you want. So I was like, boom, 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 boom. And uh, they have been uh, great friends to us. He has been a man of wisdom and great counsel uh, to me during this time. And I didn't say this in the first service, but one of the things that when you serve uh, in a position like I do, a lot of people ask me a lot of questions. A lot of people, uh, they want to know what's going on behind the scenes, like intimate things that I can't share. Or secondly, they want me to get them some tickets in the front row seats. <laughs> and my wife will tell you that's one of the things that irks me. And what I love about Pastor, whenever I talk to him, it's always about the ministry. He has never asked me for tickets. And I love that man because I thank you, Pastor. I really appreciate that. But as he said, my name is William Payne. Um, and I've been at Syracuse University for seven years. Uh, my wife, uh, Melinda, in 1994, I think, uh, she's from Syracuse. My father was a pastor, and he was uh, speaking at a conference at the Hotel Syracuse. And so I, was, I came with him to the conference, and he was the keynote speaker at this banquet. And, you know, those banquets are kind of boring. You're sitting there, you're like, why is my dad, why did I come with him? But lo and behold... There was this angel of light in the back corner, and I'm talking about the light just radiated. And while my father was speaking, I was just like this the whole time. Who is that? And it was my wife. Fast forward, we go to the same college. Now, I was just, a, you know, you got to be bold and smooth. You were bold and smooth back in the 90s. Uh, we're sitting in this first date. Going on the first date, I looked at her. I said, you know, baby, I'm going to marry you. She said, no, you're not. 27 years. I was right. I won. 27 years. 27 years. So she is a uh, a blessing to me. Uh, We have four children. Our oldest is 25, Alexandria. Uh, She works at Syracuse University as a policewoman. Uh, We have a senior in college. Uh, His name is Marcus down in Virginia. He plays football, and he's a senior. Uh, He's 21. We have a daughter who just went to Binghamton. She runs track there. And she's 18, 
And so we had this, you know, the kids are gone. Then we just started hanging out as they got older. And, and we have a five-year-old now who just started kindergarten. <laughs> so uh, my wife said uh, when Victoria graduated, we are at graduation, my, wa- my wife said it just hit me all of a sudden. We're going to be back here. Oh, my goodness. We're coming back. Uh, and all the people we know, they're gone. So uh, Victoria's in kindergarten, and we are the seasoned parents in kindergarten with our five-year-old. So she is a joy to us. I want to give you kind of an overview before we get to the mess of kind of what it, what it is that I do at Syracuse University. Because a lot of people ask, what do you actually do? Like, is, what does it mean to be a chaplain or a campus director? And what it means is to meet the spiritual needs of our student athletes and coaches at Syracuse, which is about 700 people. On a weekly basis, on Monday, we have a Bible study for all of our student athletes, and we'll have about 65 to 75 students in there. We have dinner, and then we have Bible study, and then we have a small group time. On Tuesdays, uh, I have a Bible study with coaches on Zoom, and these are primarily track coaches, and they're coaches from actually all over the country who will come on that Bible study on Tuesdays. Wednesday, I do another Zoom Bible study with some former athletes in our discipleship time. And throughout the week, uh, Thursdays and Fridays, I have to prepare for, we have chapel. We have football chapels and basketball chapels. So I'll prepare messages for that. And throughout the week, I go to uh, practice. The importance of going to practice is you get to see what's going on. Um, You get to see what's going on with the coaches and the athletes. And then I'll spend time uh, counseling them and talking with them. My wife, what she does, she does a lot of cooking. I didn't say in the first service, but she does a lot of cooking. So it works like this. I'll go to practice. And one of the football players will say, Pastor, Pastor, yo, can we have dinner at your house? Can we have dinner? i am like, man, let me see what I can do. So I'll go home and I'll say, Melinda, can we have a team dinner? She said, when? Tomorrow. How many people? 125. What? <laughs> and, but she gets it done. She gets it done. Um, so we do, a, in the summertime, we do a lot of barbecues. We try to have every team at Syracuse in our home. So she probably did between July and in August, I think she made like 95 macaroni and cheeses, and we grilled like 500 lamb chops, 800 pieces of fried chicken, you know, 50, uh, I think 150 pans of sweet potatoes, things like that. And that's every summer, and she does a great job with that. So as Pastor said, we cannot, just like he would say, we cannot do the things we do without our wives. And so I'm very grateful to her and everything that she does. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Samuel. I'm sure our text will be 1 Samuel. We'll be looking in chapter 16 as our primary text. But I want to give you a little background. This is a passage about uh, David being anointed king. But previous to that, um, the Israelites at that time, they were ruled by judges or they were under a what you want to call a theocracy, meaning that God was the one who was the leader. And the people came to Samuel one day and they said, hey, Samuel, uh, we want a king like everyone else. And as you've read the text before, Samuel was a little disappointed. Like, what you mean? You want to be like everybody else. Uh, but God told him, go ahead and let them have a king. So God tells Samuel to go ahead and anoint the first king. And the first king of Israel was a man named Saul. The Bible says that Saul was a, t- uh, a shy, quiet, he was a tall man. And the Lord used him to establish the nation of Israel. Yet some long, somewhere along the way, he got comfortable and made a grave error. He made an offering before a battle that Samuel was to make. And because of his decision, God told Samuel to go find someone else. And I want to read that to you so we have the context here. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 10 through 14. The Israelites are about to go to war, and Samuel was to come and make an offering. And look what it says. <clears throat> as soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. 
And the Lord has commanded him to be a prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to look into your word, Father. I pray that today we'll be doers of the word and not hearers only. In your precious name, amen. So the context here is this is a time where the Israelites are about to go to war and there was a process that was to take place. Saul gets a little antsy and he decides to, in a sense, help God out by making this offering, this sacrifice. Samuel comes and pretty much tells him, it's not your job to help God out. Your job is to obey. And because of Saul's disobedience, it costs him the kingdom. I just want to say real quick here that all of us must remember, it is not our job to help God out. Our job is to do what he says. I remember me and my wife, we, had, we were living in Flint, Michigan. And you know how people tell you about God provides, you need to pray in God's provision? And we're living in Flint, and we needed another vehicle. And so we had our three children. My wife was five of us. And one day I was out and about, and I saw this beautiful Cadillac. It was light blue, like Carolina Tar Heels blue. It had a white top. It was a two-door coupe, and it had the white walls with the spoke rims on it. It was pretty. The man driving the car, it looked smooth. So I went to him, and I was like, what's up with the car, man? And he was like, yo, I'm looking to get rid of the car. So I had talked to my father about needing the car. My wife knew he needed the car. And they were like, let's pray. We're going to pray about it. But I saw this car, and it was almost like, at least I thought, that God said, I want you to have the car. Even though it can't fit your family, I wouldn't have you seen the car if I didn't want you to have the car. So I go out, and guess what I did? I didn't talk to my wife. I didn't do anything. I bought the car. I get in the car, and I'm riding in the car smooth. It was smooth, man. It was, whoo. I look good. Let the window down. It's got the white top. Oh, with the, oh it was sparkling. I'm ready. I'm, I, and I pull into the driveway. I'm smiling. And lo and behold, when somebody else opened the door, I don't think they were smiling. What in the world did you do? I'm like, well, the Lord gave me this car. What you mean the Lord gave you this car? We don't need this. What you mean? We can't get in the car. You had this five of us, and we had car seats. So you had to open the door, let the seat up, and you can't even get in there to get people in the car. Well, it was, it was brutal. The worst part about it was I thought I was helping God out. So I spent money on this car that I couldn't fit my family into the car. A couple of days later, someone called me and said, I have a car for your family. It was a newer car, a bigger car, a better car. So I wasted money on things that I didn't need to do because I thought I was helping God out. Saul thought he was helping God out. And I know all of us, sometimes we do things thinking we're helping God and we're really messing things up. Your job is to obey, not help God out. I regret that. And every time, you know how in marriage you're supposed to leave the past in the past. Sometimes she's so lovely, but she can't, she don't have no problem reminding me. You thought, oh, okay, baby, that's the end of the argument. So Saul here is in this place where he has messed up. And now Israel is in need of a new king. And so the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 16 that Samuel goes to the town of Bethlehem. And he goes to a house of a man named Jesse. Now, could you imagine the prophets coming to your house? He knock at the door, and you know he's looking for a new king. Man, that's got to be the greatest feeling. Out of all the people in the world, the prophet come to my house, and one of my sons is going to be king. Well, you, you like, you'd be smiling like, shh. Yo, you look at your wife like, yo, you know one of my boys is going to be king, right? You know, you just... This is the house. We, we about to be established. And so he shows up at the house, and it says here, verse 6, When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. He goes to the house of Jesse, and Jesse's oldest son comes out. And Samuel was like, I know this man is it. Now, you got to remember the oldest son in that culture. The oldest son was everything. And, I'm, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings when I say this, please. And I hope we, we all are family here, right? So I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But how many of you have, think about in your family, you have brothers and sisters, right? 
your parents, the child who is the hero of the family, the one that they took 150,000 pictures of, the one that they bragged about to everyone, is always the firstborn. Nobody, when you call, when you first get pregnant and you call your mom and your grandparents, like, who's that? The firstborn grandchild. The firstborn. It's like, it's, it, it, it's so think about Jesse. He's very excited. Oh, my firstborn son is going to be king. The Bible tells us that he was a soldier. So, you know, he was handsome. He looked the part. He probably came out there walking hard. And if Samuel looked at him, the Bible says Samuel looked at him and said, Oh, I know that boy is it. He looks like a king. Woo! That boy is going to be king. Boy. And God said, oh, 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 hold up. Hold up, man. I mean, I know he looked the part. I know he, 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 he smooth. I know he got the muscles. I know he looked, but hold up. Verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance. When I read that, I, I pretty much knew Eliab must have looked good. He must have been handsome. Or his height. He must have been tall. You know, everybody likes tall. Paul, tall people walk in the room and everybody looks at him. Yo, man, how tall are you, man? I'm 6'5", 6'5", 6'6". You know? For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Samuel got caught up looking on the outward things. Jesse was probably caught up because he's my firstborn son. Now, as the pastor said, we have four children. The oldest is uh, Alexander, my oldest child. We love Alexander. I remember when we first, Melinda first told me she was pregnant. And we probably have in our house 125,000 pictures of Alexandria. We snapped everything. Chicka, chicka, chicka. Oh, she breathed. Chicka, oh, oh, chicka, oh, oh, she turned, chicka, chicka, chicka. And then after that, the Lord gave us a boy. So the firstborn boy, oh, we got a boy, we got a chicka, 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 chicka. You're taking pictures of, oh, look at it, look at it. Oh, he woke up. Chicka, chicka. Oh, 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 he's, chicka. 125,000 pictures. And then we had another child, the third, the third one. We were tired. <laughs> she posed and doing flips. She's like, uh, she, she's, she was walking at two months and being like, oh, forget it. Oh, she's, she's talking at, at, at three months. Oh, we don't see none of that. We didn't take pictures of anything. As a matter of fact, one day she was in the house and she's like, mom, dad, you got all these pictures of the firstborn and the second. Where am I at? Oh, man, you know, we're tired. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry. But you know how that firstborn, and you can imagine when Jesse, when Solomon, uh, when Samuel comes, he probably assumed in his mind that his firstborn son was going to be king. But God tells him the standard that God has is not based on anything outward, it is based on the heart of the individual. So he says, nah, he's not the one. Could you imagine the first one? You're not good enough. You're not it. And they're probably like, oh, put his head down. Okay, okay. And then his Bible says he brings a second born, a bit of that. They said he had him pass in front of Samuel. So you can imagine if you have a younger brother or sister, however it works, usually the second child is always trying to overcome the first one. So you can imagine the second boy was like, oh, he didn't make it. He didn't get it. It's about to be me. He probably walking out like, yeah, dad, you call me. You, y'all looking for the king. You know, I know he ain't good enough. And he's probably smiling like, y'all know about to get the king. I'm about to be the king. And God says, no. So now he's over for two. Jesse probably started off. He was smiling. He was happy. Oh, he didn't take my first two. So let's go get another one. So number three comes up. Yo, man, Samuel, I know these first two didn't cut it. You know, I, I know I'm the one. I'm number three. I know, you know, them two, they don't do no work anyway. They're not leaders. I, I got you covered. And God said, no. Now imagine, think about being in that position. And someone comes to your house to evaluate your children, and you got these kids, the first three don't make the cut. Oh, Jesse was like, oh, man, oh, oh man, what's going on? All right, all right, all right, all right. We can, you can get it right. We bring it, let's bring another one. So he brings out son number four. Okay. Hey, dad. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, dad, how you doing? Uh, Samuel might have said to him, 
What makes you different than the other children? Um, well, you know, I love the Lord. Uh, I, I read the Torah yesterday. I pray five times a day. Uh, anything else you're looking for so I can be the king? Nah, man, you ain't got to go sit down. Uh, number four is done. It says, oh, send me someone else. Five comes. Oh, for five. Oh, for six. Finally, oh, for seven. Now, could you imagine, Jesse? Oh, Jesse was, at the beginning, he was probably all smiling. Oh, my boy's about to be king. And then all of a sudden, oh, for seven. No one makes the cut. The Bible says, Samuel looked at him and said, uh, do you have any more kids, any more sons? He goes, yeah. Now, what'd you say? Then I'll see. No, what did you, man, just, do you have any more sons? Uh, the young girl's going out in the sheep. Say it in a way that I can hear you. The youngest one's out in the sheep. Go get David. So think about it. All the other seven boys are in the house. They all got rejected. They got to go out and get David. So imagine David coming down this middle aisle here, the, the older brother's looking. You can know they were mad. And David come down there, yeah, dad, yeah, dad. What, 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 what you want? They're looking like, this dude? And the Bible says he came into the room and the Lord said, he is the one. God took a nobody in his own family's eyes and said he was somebody. He's a person who is going to do great things and can lead because he had a heart for God. So many times we focus on, especially as parents, we focus on so many things, be it sports, academics, they got to do this, jobs, all these things. And we forget that to be successful, if you want our young people, our children, if you want to be successful, it's about having a heart for God that will elevate them and take them places they never imagined. It's so easy to get caught up in the world, especially athletics. I, I always say to people, and I hope you don't do this, don't be one of these parents. I, you ever meet people and you ask them, what are your kids up to? And people who are, whose kids are athletes who are really good, Man, they're talking and saying, oh, y'all, he playing ball, man. He averaged 28 points a game, you know, double-double. We won sectionals. He won state. He get recruited here and there, here and there. They'll go on and on and on. Very rarely do you hear people say, you know what? Um, you know, my son is just studying the Word of God. My daughter's studying the Word of God. They memorize the Word of God. They're discipling people. They're leader in their youth group. They're leader in their church. They don't do that things. They don't even say my son, kid or daughter's on the honor roll. They talk about sports, 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 sports. And you know what? And all the sports don't matter. What matters is the heart. One of the hardest things I have, I struggle with in my role when you're traveling is not getting caught up in the games. Because like, you're, you're, you're there and I'm supposed to be balanced and I'm supposed to meet spiritual needs. But it's very easy to become a fan. And, you know, fans can be... Uh, I'm not, if you're a fan, you know, we appreciate you. But fans can be rough, okay? One minute they love you, the next minute they're ready to throw a brick at you. You know, it's one of the two things, either one or the other. Or they talk about your mama on social media. It can be rough when there's a fan. And so I try to stay balanced. I'm trying to stay balanced and not get caught up. But even I, sometimes we'll have recruits come in, and they come in, and all the good athletes, especially basketball players, they always walk like this, like their knees hurt. They'd be like six, eight, but what's up, pastor? I'll be like, how you doing? Yo, what's up, man? You know, I'm good. They walk like this, like their knees hurt. The football players, the good fo the football players who think they're real good, they walk and they work hard like this. They be like this. Yeah, man, how you doing, brother? Yeah, yeah all right, brother. Yeah, yeah, they do things like that. And, and I'm sitting there, and I'm making judgments. Like, this kid, is this kid special? This kid can play. And I'm getting caught up in all the outward things. And I'm like, oh, yeah, he's going to help us win games, or he's going to do this and that. And the, so many times, the people who wore the best gear, had the nicest haircut, they come in, I'm making this judgment, they're the worst players ever. If you ever watch the games, I sit on the third row of the bench. It goes one, two, three for basketball. This dude should have been sitting by me. I was on the court more than he was. But I made these judgments. And I'm trying to say that I've learned over time that all of that stuff doesn't matter because it will pass away. The Hebrew word for heart signifies to any inner person encompassing emotions, intentions, and moral, moral character. 
God's evaluation goes beyond the superficial to the core of our being. In essence, God told Samuel, listen, I don't care how tall he is. I don't care how strong they are. I don't care the color of their hair. He's telling you and I the same thing. All of the outward things do not matter. It's about having a heart for me. And I'm going to tell you, church, my prayer in here is that everyone in here has a heart for God. The only way you're going to have a heart for God is you have to know him. You have to make sure that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. A lot of people, they look good on the outside. I've had coaches, I've seen coaches, they look good on TV, and 10 minutes later in the back of the room crying. Problems, athletes, identity problems, because people have only looked at the outward things and no one has tried to minister to their hearts. And that's what it's all about. So the question becomes, how do you know what's in someone's heart. We'll look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. We can see it here. The evidence of what's in someone's heart is their actions. In 1 Samuel 17, I know you've heard the story. Read the story about David and Goliath. Now remember, the Israelites are fighting the Philistines, and they were basically mortal enemies. And the Bible says that Goliath came out daily to taunt the Israelites. You know, y'all can't fight, y'all not, y'all weak, your God's not strong. You know, you little puny dudes can't do nothing. Your daddy's ugly, your mama's ugly, your sheep are ugly, your food's ugly. You guys aren't worth two cents. I wish y'all would come out here and say something to me. And the clothes y'all wear are not brand name, so y'all can't do anything. Y'all little cheap little Israelites, what you gonna do? You wanna fight? Come on, come on. And the Bible says that the Israelites were scared. Day after day, Goliath came out and taunted them. What happens? This young boy named David is going up to visit to take his brother some food. You know, Dad, go, go see your brothers and take them something to eat. And David shows up, and the Bible says David heard Goliath coming out. Goliath's talking once again, your mama, your daddy, your mama, your mama's ugly, your sister's ugly, your brother's ugly, your cousin's ugly. And David heard all of it. And the Bible says David said, What's going to happen to this uncircumcised Philistine who's talking trash about the people of God? David decides to stand up. But I want you to notice something. Who didn't stand up? Saul, who was the leader, didn't stand up. Saul, who was the leader of those men, should have been the one. The Bible says that Saul said... uh, I'm not fighting, but if any man defeats Goliath, I will offer him wealth and he can be a part of my family. So Saul the king, the man who was first anointed, has now gotten scared like, uh, somebody got to fight this guy. No, nah, <clears throat> ain't going to be me. No, nah, man, I ain't do that. Remember David's brother, the oldest, Eliab was there. The Bible says that when David spoke up, Eliab got mad and he basically said to David, stop talking. You're being arrogant. Go back and watch the sheep. He was trying to insult him, trying to embarrass him in front of everyone. But guess what he didn't do? He didn't volunteer to fight. He wasn't going to do it. None of David's brothers who were in the army volunteered. None of the men who were in the army who had been there, who had been trained to fight, none of them stood up. Because I think that in their heart, man, they was, they, ooh, they was melting like butter. Scared. I ain't, I ain't fighting this dude. But guess what happened? David, who was there to take food to his older, stronger, and supposedly braver brothers, saw this and stepped up. Notice what he said in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 34 to 37. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. 
what was in David's heart came out. Remember 16.7? God says, I'm looking for a man. I'm looking at these inward things. Basically, is it a man who loves me? Is it a man who trusts me? David says, I was willing to beat the lion and the bear because God was with me and I could beat this guy too. Now, you know, I don't know if you've been in a situation where everybody, you know, saw and them were like, yeah, you're going to beat this. They ain't saying nothing. They're like, yo, David, you going out to fight? Yeah, man, go on, go on out there. This dude ain't winning. His brothers was like, probably, his brother probably thought, well, I guess we're getting a new king. Um, his other, the, uh, the other soldiers like, yo, this dude about to get ate up. But you know what? When you think about it, if God had already told David that you're going to be king, David knew in his heart that there was no way he was going to lose. He had already been anointed. And so the Bible says that David, full of uh, boldness and faith, stood up. Goliath was insulted like, you bringing this little dude to fight me? And David was like, <clears throat> yo, man, I don't need no armor. All I need is my little thingy, the little slingshot, and I'm going to cut your head off. And he throws him, he cuts his head off. So the Bible says that Goliath went down and David defeated him. Why? Because David had a heart that was committed to God. He was different than everyone else. Man, folks, I'm telling you, like, the most important thing that you can do is to develop a heart for God, your own personal heart for God, the personal heart with your children, your grandchildren, the people in your spirit. Teach them what it means to have a heart for God, which is basically means to do what he says in his word. But guess what? We have an enemy, Satan. He doesn't want us to do that. So Satan will put things in our life to take us away from God, our heart. First thing he'll use is finances. Now, we all need finances. But if you're in a position where your finances control you, where you will will not willing to sacrifice your finances for the things of God, there's a problem. We know that because remember the story of the rich young ruler? The Bible says the rich young ruler came. He said, Master, what must I do? Jesus said, follow the commandments. He said, oh, I follow all the commandments. I'm good. And then Jesus said the one thing that he didn't want to do. He said, take everything you have and sell it and give it to the poor. And the Bible says the rich man said, oh, no, I ain't do that. No, I ain't doing that. He basically said, the Bible says, he said, I cannot do that. He was saddened because he had much. Do not let your finances control you. God gives you finances ultimately for his work. And part of work is take care of your family and and to invest in eternal things. That's what it's for. But it can control you. Some of us have jobs that take our heart away from God. We say a lot of things. We say, I believe God, I trust God. But if you have a job that asks you to compromise your Christian beliefs, if you want to get ahead and you have to compromise your Christian beliefs, you got to ask yourself, is this the job for me? Do I need to go somewhere else and let God elevate me somewhere else? Or do I stay in a place that is causing me to not get closer to the Lord, but to create distance. Your jobs can do that. Jobs, sometimes people have jobs where they can't never come to church service or they can't go to Bible study or small group. Like, if you have a job where you can never do anything that has any spiritual, you can't do anything that will help your spiritual growth, there's probably an issue. Because pastors are available. If there's no time, if you can't make it Sunday, he'll say, let me do it on Monday. If you can't make it Monday, let's do it Tuesday. But if there ain't no time, there's probably a problem, and your heart may not be where it is. Relationships can keep our heart from God. You know, the Bible says that Solomon, you remember about Solomon asked for wisdom, and God blessed him, and then Solomon got involved with a whole bunch of women he wasn't supposed to, and it took his, way, his heart away from God. Some of us, those who are in dating relationships, God's standard is that you date people who are believers. Not pe- you're not to be unequally yoked. And so I run into a lot of people who be like, 
Uh, Pastor Payne, I got this boyfriend. I got this girlfriend. They're great. Man, they take me out to nice dinners. They open up the car door. They're sweet. And the question is, the only question I ask, do, you, do they love Jesus? Do they know Jesus? Well, they may not know Jesus, but uh, they, got a, they, they got a nice attitude. Well, do they know Jesus? Well, uh, they, uh, um, um, they help me study. Do, do they know Jesus? Well, uh, the, uh, but, 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 do they know Jesus? Do they know Jesus? Do they know Jesus? Because that's the question. And ultimately, people have to make a choice. Am I going to be committed to the things of God? Or am I going to be committed to the things that I want? And ultimately, those who are married, sometimes our wives or husbands can keep us from having a heart for God. Remember God told Abraham that you're going to have a son? And Sarah told him, well, it ain't going to be through me, so let's figure out another way to do this. And Abraham followed his wife's advice, and it has caused problems to this day. My point to you is this. If you're married, and if you want the best marriage possible, husbands, love the Lord God with all your heart. Ladies, if your husband has a heart for God, he will love you, he will go the extra mile and do things for you you never thought possible. Wives, husbands, you pray that your wife has a heart for the things of God. If she loves God first and he's number one, she will do everything she can to honor him. Guess what? She will honor you. So many times we get caught up and think, I'm doing everything. Melinda is my everything. And Melinda may say, William is my everything. I can't be her everything. Only God can be your everything. And we try to do it ourselves. It takes us away from God and we depend upon each other. And you got two sinners depending on each other, you're going to have problems. Lastly, children. Woo, children. Everyone, parent, loves their child. But it can be tough when you know the right thing and your child is asking you to support or condone their sin. And we get afraid to stand up and say what we need to say because we're worried about what they think and we're not worried about what God thinks. Now, I'm a parent. I, you remember I had three children? Four. I got three older children and one the, the five-year-old. And I'm guilty of this. My kids say to me, Dad, the, the youngest, is she going to be bad, Dad? You don't do anything. You don't discipline. You just let her do what she wants to do. And to be honest, I do. I'm tired. I'm tired, man. I am tired, man. I ain't trying to do that. My wife will be like, she'll get in trouble with my wife. My wife will discipline her, and then she'll look at me. She's very good at this. She'll look at me, and she said, Daddy, I love you. I'm like, hold her, and I look at my wife. I'm like, why did you discipline her? What did you do? And my older daughters will come over and visit, and there'll be a large argument in the house, a five-year-old and 25-year-old, and my five-year-old will know like to drop a tear. Now, I, I won't see anything, but I'll hear things. I'll come upstairs. What you do to my child? What y'all doing to my child? Man, it's so hard. The girl may be a t- little terrorist. I don't know. But she, I, 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 it is, I would tell you, and I need to do better. It would be, it is very hard for me to step up and say, Alana, what you did is wrong. Because she says those famous words. Daddy, I love you. I'm like, oh, great. That's great. But we need to make sure that we don't let other things come in a way that take away from our heart from God. So real quick as we close, here are the characteristics of a person with a heart for God. Number one, they have put their faith and trust in Jesus for salvation. No way you can have a heart for God without knowing him. A person with a heart for God is humble. A person with a heart for God is dependent upon him. A person with a heart for God is willing to serve others. A person with a heart for God will follow him wherever he leads. A person with a heart for God will put his will over theirs. I want to encourage you, man. This is all about everything that you do here at this church. Read the Bible. You can come. You can listen. It's really about what's in here your heart. And God is still looking for people with a heart for him. 
encourage you to continue to grow in your knowledge of him. And this book will change your life. Every pastor I know, and your pastor in particular, all he wants is this right here, that you all have a heart for the things of God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to look into it, Father. I pray that you are honored and glorified in your precious name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. You can see the quality of the individuals that we have the opportunity to invest in. That there are students, and and I want you to also know that this past week we have sponsored and picked up as missionary Jay Koshy, who is uh, the director of the International Friendship Evangelism on Syracuse University. I had a chance to go and be with our international students. Some of the top students in the world are coming to Syracuse University. Knowing that Grace Assembly has fingerprints on that campus with the people that we support is important. Because not only do we touch our city, we touch the world through these students. I don't know how many of you did not have a chance to participate last week, but last week was our Faith Promise Sunday where we had Faith Promise cards on every seat. Bill Kirk led us through those, and if you weren't here or you took your card home because you wanted to pray about what you wanted to do, let me just remind you that it's through the faith promise, your missions giving, that we create a missions budget at our church that allows us to bring on more and more missionaries, support projects around the world. And so if you've not had an opportunity, there are cards available on the welcome table, and there's a a wooden bowl there if you'd fill that out. So that's above your tithe. That's above your building fund. This is just saying, Lord, I do not want the world to pass me by without having invested in those that are winning souls. And we would love to have you participate in that. After the first week, I can tell you that we have 30% more pledged this year than we've ever had before. After the first week, 30%. Huge increase. The way that we're going to close this service is we have a tradition here at our church that we get to pray. I pray for our missionary. I recognize we've prayed for a lot of people today. Well, we're not quite done yet. But I would like Pastor William and Melinda, if they would please come and and stand here in the front. This is that angel he was talking about. Cindy and I are delighted to be able to call this couple our friends. I mean, he has to speak. She has to cook. Who do you think's job's harder here? Let's let's be honest about this thing. I'm grateful that God has called them into this ministry, and it's not an easy ministry. When you're dealing with coaches and you're dealing with athletes, you're dealing with sometimes students who are really, really good at one thing. I I had an opportunity to speak one night at one of the huddles, and and it's not something I do often because I don't have anything in common with those students at all. But I had a conversation with one of the girls, and she was taller than me. Of course, everybody in the room was taller than me. And I just sat there at the end of just speaking about value, and she had tears in her eyes. And, and I said, what, what's causing your tears? And she said, sometimes I feel like I'm a commodity and not a person. She goes, to my family, to my friends, to the school, I'm only as good as the points I score. And she says, I'm really, really struggling with the fact that if this isn't who I am, then who can I be in God? And I begin to think about that and... and, and the, the mindset of a generation that believes they're only as good as what they do, and then we hear a word about the heart. And so we pray God's anointing upon this family, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask if you would stand with me, and if you're a student at Syracuse University, or if you have business with the university, or teacher, or something like that, would you come, and would you just gather around them here? In the first service, we had a, a number of students that were here. In fact, we had one of the coaches that was here to stand with them, but, but if you're involved at Syracuse University at all, would you come? If you graduated from Syracuse University... Let me 
introduce you and, and have you come as well. If you just stand around them and, and uh, there you go. And we're going to pray for our missionaries. Our Heavenly Father, as we stand before you, we recognize the sovereignty and uniqueness of those that you choose for specific roles in your kingdom. William and Melinda are standing here because they said yes to you. And as a result of that, you have taken their hearts and their marriage and their lives and you have molded them in such a way that probably the greatest example they are, is the greatest message they give is the example of their life. As students in particular look and, and they want to see who is real and who is not. And I pray that what they see when they look at this family is the light of Jesus within their heart genuinely caring about individuals, not for what they can produce for a school, not for what they can do on a field or on a court, but for who you have created them to be. And that through the word that he speaks and the meals that she prepares and the conversations that take place in their backyard and around their table with coaches and coaches' wives and husbands and students and athletes, Lord, that somehow that they would recognize the genuineness of the heart of this family and I ask oh God that you would give them a sense of discernment that can see things that aren't being said that can read a heart and a mind and that through that they would have the ability to guide and direct and introduce people to a Jesus that won't matter for a game but will matter for eternity and Lord, since we have invested in them as our fingers extended into the campus of Syracuse University to touch a group of people that desperately needs to know that their value is in Jesus, I ask that you would anoint them. Sprinkle them daily with the presence of the living God. May the Holy Spirit speak in them and through them, and may they have eternal impact on a campus that desperately needs Jesus. And so, Lord, it is our honor to invest in their ministry. It is our honor to lay hands upon them, and it is our honor to pray for them daily that they would live under the umbrella of your blessing and your anointing. And we seal this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. And everyone says, Amen and Amen. Thank you. While you're standing, let me conclude this service. Can I tell you, first of all, how proud I am of you? I am so grateful that represented within this congregation is such generous hearts. You were talking about the heart today. Can I tell you about the heart of this church? We love people. And we love souls, and we love you, and we love those that you minister to, and we love this community. And so they are unbelievably generous because we've recognized there's a difference in investing in things that won't last and investing in things that are eternal. You're among a great group of people today, and I can assure the two of you there won't be a day that goes by that we don't pray for you. And so, Father, at the end of this service, I now ask that you would lead us and guide us. May our hearts be tender as we have heard the word. That which has been planted within us, I now ask that you would water with your Holy Spirit so that we would resemble you more and more as every day goes by. And may we walk in the joy of the Lord, for that is our strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.